Hello and welcome to News Click's show, Mapping Fault Lines. In today's show, we're going to be talking about a number of developments which have been taking place in various fault lines across the world. First major issue that has happened is the recent U.S. airstrikes on Syria and Iraq. This, have, this happened a few days ago. This is the second such round of strikes since Joe Biden assumed office as the president of the United States. A lot of criticism after these airstrikes because the Democrats, many organizations in the past had you know, severely criticized such steps when Trump was in power and Biden came to power saying that, you know, he would avoid, he would bring an end to many of these forever wars, but nonetheless, airstrikes continuing. So we have with us Prabir Prakash to talk about this. Prabir, of course, we know that the strikes were on Syria and Iraq, but they were targeted at the militia groups, which are part of the popular mobilization front, which are part of the Iraqi army. And there are strong links between them and the Iranians. So clearly this was not about uh, striking at Syria, but a larger geopolitical uh, play, so to speak, by the United States. And this is happening, like we discussed last time, even as talks are on in Vienna to see if the US can re-enter the deal. So amid this, how do we see an attack on these uh, militia groups, which are very closely associated with both Iraq and Iran? Well, officially, they're part of the Iraqi armed forces. So, you know, to say they are close to both actually doesn't bring out the technical nature of the picture here. And that's the, what is the international law on this? The second is if the strikes took place either in Syria or in Iraq, and it seemed to have taken place in both places, it did not take into account the fact they need the permission of these countries. Otherwise, it's a really an act of war. The third is the Iraqi prime minister was just a few days back with the PMF, the militia forces that we're talking about, and talked about how they're a part of the Iraqi armed forces and what is the role they have played in fighting against the Al-Qaeda ISIS forces. So all of this is also a complete negation of the United States position that they are somehow there by invitation of the Iraqi government, which they were once upon a time, and this therefore has the sanction of their invitation. The question is, it is an independent country. They're no longer an occupying power, even according to them. Therefore, if they want to carry out military action, they need the permission of the Iraqi government, which they obviously did not have. The second part of it, that this is against whom? Essentially to send the signal, apparently, to the Iranians. Now, the Iranians do not control this militia. They may have relationship with them. They have militarily had close links with them in training them. All of that is true because it's true that the Iranian forces fought with the militias, with the Iraqi government forces in order to fight back the Al-Qaeda forces, the ISIS forces in Iraq. So that's a part of the history. And Soleimani was the one who also spearheaded that battle. So given that, the argument that this is an attack somehow on Irani-backed militias falls really flat. And that's really not the issue. So the question is, what is the United States doing? At the moment, it seems that Biden is playing by the same playbook that Trump used, which is uh, withdraw from the uh, accord and then pressurize Iran to give more and more concessions hoping that at some point Iran will succumb. Now, in this case, there is a negotiations going on right now in order for the United States to re-enter the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear uh, agreement. Now, in that, are these essentially ploys? Are they just moves that the US is doing to build up pressure on Iran? Of course, it hurts Iraqis as well, as well as Syria. But is that the game plan? Is it something to do with what they want to achieve in Syria itself? Which, as you know, they have backed the Kurdish forces to the north. They also have al a small enclave, where they're essentially sheltering the remnants of the, uh, those forces who fought against Bashar al-Assad's government. And of course, you have also Turkey in the play. So what is the United States game plan in Syria is also not clear because there is no end objective that we can see coming out of the US intervention, except to keep some parts of Syria under occupation 
with the actual American forces also being there. They're still there in the occupation in some parts of Syria and close to the parts which they have bombed. So all of this makes the US objective not clear whether it is Iraq, Syria, or it is Iran. If it is to pressurize Iran, then I think they are again uh, going the wrong way. Blinken seems to have also talked about how this nuclear agreement re-entering the JCPOA will continue into missile discussions, trying to disarm Iran's missile uh, uh, forces that they have, the capabilities they have. And also, there is also talk about how to get Iran to disengage, that's the kind of words that we see, from the larger West Asian uh, involvement. Now, that means giving up all the foreign policy in, you know, engagements Iran has in West Asia with Syria, with Levin, Hezbollah in Lebanon, with the Houthis in Yemen, essentially, therefore, to succumb to the United States pressure. So in, in some sense, it seems to be an extension of the Trump line that if you want to re-enter the economic agreements that you uh, earlier had reached, you have to surrender both your military prowess, all your uh, ability to provide a strategic alternative in the region, and you have to also forego all the influence that you have received. So essentially accept defeat without a war. And that's an unlikely position with uh, Riyasi even coming into uh, the president's uh, position in, the, in Iran. But even without that, even under Rouhani, this would not have been something which would have been acceptable. So I think what the United States is trying to achieve through negotiations, something they have failed through the sanctions. And that's a very, very unlikely position to make. So I don't really understand what this signifies, except that it has destabilized Iraq a little more, and it has not solved any of the issues of the region. And it seems to make the JCPOA, return to the JCPOA in the United States coming back a little more difficult. And therefore, we might see a, again a ratcheting up of sanctions and of course, Iran responding with what they're already doing, which is gradually abandoning the agreement because they feel that it's not getting them anywhere. The US is not returning and the European Union powers, European powers were a part of the agreement are unwilling to do anything in order to lift the sanctions. So this is going to come to a make or break soon. And whether in the next three months we'll see a return to JCPOA or we'll see its formal abandonment, that's what we'll have to see. Right. Although it's interesting that uh, the US is getting more entangled in West Asia at a time when the prevailing consensus has, has been that it is trying to move more towards countering Russia and China uh, and creating some kind, and you know, it's launched some sort of a new Cold War, so to speak. Many observers have pointed that out. So on the one hand, so, the know, US the is trying to- a very interesting point that you're raising, that Trump also made exactly the same promises, if you remember, except right. of course, withdrawing from the Iran Accord, the nuclear accord. But his promises bringing back the troops, everything was very similar. And right. then he got sucked in, his, into the forever wars that the United States has launched in the region, including Afghanistan. We'll have to right. see where they lead from here. Right, Prabir. So as you said, so what we're looking at is a very dangerous scenario where the nuclear deal itself is under threat. Either party might walk out in the next few months for, uh, for different reasons, like you pointed out. But returning to the issue I just raised in terms of the new Cold War sort of building up between the US on one hand and Russia and China, or rather the US actions precipitating this. We saw another example a few, uh, a few days ago when a British ship entered into the waters of Crimea. And according to the British, it was a freedom of navigation operation, which is seems to be the common excuse used by the US and its allies across the world. And of course, the Russians had to take some steps. They, uh, they did not, of course, engage the ship directly in any way, but they did fire some warning shots. The British, of course, claiming that this was all innocent and it was, you know, at some level, they were, of course, uh, say reasserting their freedom of navigation. But how do we see this kind of a provocation at a time when things are already extremely tense? Everyone knows what the situation in the region is, in the Black Sea region, of course. So how do we see this kind of a provocation at this point of time? 
you know, the UK warship going into the waters, which is where the issue really rises, and what that means in terms of international law, law of seas, we can examine. But the bigger picture is that the Black Sea has now become a area where you have also the NATO uh, naval maneuvers that, that are slated or going on. So you are already seeing NATO forces, naval forces moving into Black Sea. Now, are they going to, as a formation, test the what the Russians have said about Crimea and the limits they have put on in what is called right of innocent passage? Now, in territorial waters, so that's really the issue here. So that is something that we'll have to see. But the backdrop really is the fact that the Black Sea is increasingly becoming something of a uh, theater of contention, if you will, if not a theater of war at the moment. And the fact that there are these plans to move in navies of other countries, NATO forces going there, that means can this, was this testing the waters, in this case, literally, so that, you know, we know what they will know what the Russian response is likely to be. You know, there are two things that are interesting over here. When a warship passes close to a territory, in this case, Sevastopol is the uh, Russian port over there, which they have their, uh, that's a warm water uh, base for the Navy. So when it uh, does that, it also maps the defense of the naval defenses, because then you see the radars swing into action, you see what is happening. So these are territorial waters. When you pass to the territorial waters, which are contested in this particular way, and I'll come to the legal part of it, that's also simply to map out what are the defense forces that are there on the shore and what are the kind of radars that are there. So that, that exercise is why you have these passages as well, because all of it gets then activated, alerted. So that's the information that you gather. And that is why when you talk of an innocent passage, that you are not going to do this is something that then is what is being asked of, that you will not do a certain set of measures which can lead to this information, which is essentially a spying action. So it's an intelligence operation under the guise of innocent passage. So that is the other part of it, that innocent passage, this was not, because the way it happened it was clearly they wanted to test the defenses that were there, not in terms of a war, but in terms of finding out what these defenses are. Now, here is the issue. They have said that this is this territorial waters belongs to Ukraine, and therefore they had taken permission of the Ukrainian government. Therefore, they had a right of innocent passage because Ukraine has given them this right. Now, the international law on this is quite clear that at the moment, According to NATO, according to UK, according to all their allies, this is the so Crimea is occupied territory. And if it is occupied territory, this is the, uh, the various resolution they have moved in the United Nations as well. This is the, what they're claiming from all pulpits. If that is so, then it is not the law of seas that operates. Then it is a law of war that operates because Russia is now an occupying power. The question is, can, as an occupying power, can Russia declare what are the zones within which they will not let warships come in? And this is something which has been done by the United States, for instance, in Iraq. There are enough instances of this. Of course, uh, if you take, for instance, what Israel does in Gaza, there is, of course, a bigger issue over there. Are they considering themselves occupying power, therefore uh, not allowing ships to enter the territorial waters of Gaza? Or are they blockading Gaza because a, uh, they consider it to be a state of war they have between themselves and Hamas? Israel has never clarified this. But all these blockades or uh, territorial waters that you say you the occupying power has legal rights over. It follows from the fact that if you occupy the land, then the territorial waters are also considered under occupation. And that is, so either way, 
whether Crimea belongs to Russia, you recognize their, their, uh, what the citizens have done through a referendum or not, or you consider is as an occupying power. Either way, the Russian authorities have the right to forbid, forbid in this case, innocent passage of warships. All passage of warships they can forbid of countries without taking their permission. And as I said, this by all means was not innocent passage. So the both counts, whether it's international law or whether the intent of the act was just passing uh, some ships through some waters, this doesn't qualify. And we now have the famous map, which BBC made public, that there's a debate within the British uh, government, whether this should be done or not. Two routes were identified. And the fact that they chose this route was in, within, they had some differences within the government. Finally, they chose this route. Of course, the story of these uh, vital documents being found in a bus stop, uh, it, I don't know how credible this information is because I don't think BBC would have aired this without taking permission from the government. So it does seem within the British government, there were some differences on the risks in, that were being taken by doing this. But I think the larger issue really is that the United Kingdom is willing to test the waters as uh, in this particular case of Crimea and also make the situation for Russia and European Union much tougher. Because you, as you know, large sections of the European Union would like some kind of normalcy to return with, in the, with Russia. And the United Kingdom, of course, being just a, a little bit of an island uh, off the coast, they, they have no such stake in the larger Eurasian economy of which the European Union is a part. And they having walked out of European Union makes it even more uh, simple for them to say, we are interested really in partnership with the United States. We are interested in our financial services we offer to the world. And therefore, we really are not interested in the Eurasian landmass. We are now a truly an Atlantic power. And that's the Atlantic that they're looking to, or across the Atlantic that they're looking to for their lands. So in this case, it's quite possible. The UK is acting as a spoiler in the European Union's relationship with Russia and China, which is still on the edge, but still exists. And economically, it's still a growing uh, of growing importance to the European Union. Thank you so much, Pramir, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.